I think climate change is the biggest grift in history. And if you realize the whole thing's a grift, then you realize that a bet on, for example, uranium, it's got to be a bet that the power grift will shift to uranium and let you have your bet. There, there has to be credit crises. I, I by the way, own the three biggest platinum miners. I, I would say probably all wars are natural resource wars. But we're right now at the pinnacle of the biggest bubble in history, I would argue. I think the biggest equity position is Rio Tinto. From here, you said, what's the correction? 75%? All right, how's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and I'm here today for some uh, macro talks with David Collum, who's um, the most popular professor of organic chemistry at Cornell University. He's a sworn libertarian, therefore necessarily a gold bug, or I'm just assuming here. He's also the owner of four dogs and potentially a secret CIA agent or maybe a, a distant relative to Sir Cornell himself. So I'm looking forward to this conversation with you, Dave. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here. You know, you were at some level joking about being a CIA agent, but it turns out my grandfather was CIA. Okay. I didn't know it. He was in Thailand from 55 to 62. And anyone who knows how the CIA works knows that if there's an American in Thailand from 55 to 62, they were also CIA. Have and you and want... it never Go clicked. Ahead. But then one day I, I was I was going through a, a huge, huge box of old photos. I started running into pictures of him in fatigues with guys with in front of a Huey with machine guns. I go, oh, yeah, that's not a banker. That, <laughs> that, that guy's got a different job on the side. Hey, and my son gonna... works at the CFR, so so mm. my son actually works at the CFR, so so I am by birth connected to the Death Stars. Well, it's the the only connection that I make there is that I watched uh, a series on Netflix. It's called Narcos, and so I don't know if you've watched, but it, it's about Pablo Escobar, and uh, so the CIA's influence. That's the only thing I know, but it's just it's it's not what it seems on the surface. That's the only thing I I can say there. So. Well, so if you read about Operation Gladio, no, it's, it's Operation Gladio was a book I read. I'm, I've actually been digging deep into pedophilia, and I hasten to add intellectually, not not physically. Um, but I've been interested in the question of what's the role of pedophilia in geopolitics. Now, obviously, Epstein illustrates that there is a role, but I think Epstein was a small, tiny fraction of the whole story. And so I've been digging into that and dug into a thing called Operation Gladio, um, which was a, uh, an, a post-war operation in which the CIA, the Vatican and organized crime worked together. And they actually started and, and ran the entire global drug trade. So I always thought the CIA had their fingertips in the drug trade. They were the drug trade. And to the extent that you go, now it was organized crime, you go, the triumvirate, the Vatican, the CIA, and organized crime, they, it was the, the three crime families who were running the drug trade. So, Is that only a political? Because we, we sort of started just talking about it, maybe uh, indeed have jo jokingly, but now you're going to points where I'm thinking – like this has re this have th – this has financial markets uh, – effects like the, the, it, this necessarily has to tie into the financial markets right how, how how does the cia tie into the financial markets well the most famous connection is the 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 international bank bcci which collapsed in which uh they were the 12th largest bank in the world and it was basically a bank that did all the drug running and the and uh, and 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 illicit things in the intelligence agencies and 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 dictators and stuff were all using BCCI. Um, it collapsed. Whether whether it was a controlled collapse, I don't know, or whether something got out of control and all of a sudden it collapsed. I said, "Oh, we blew that one, didn't we?" Um, I believe that the, the BCCI clientele went over to places like HSBC. And HSBC became the bankers of the drug trade, for example, um, along with the Vatican Bank. And, um, and you know, HSBC were restructuring their drive through window so you could shove crates of money through the window. I mean, this was recently, actually. And, and so, so, so the banks are all part of, of the drug trade, true. They, they know they're laundering drug money. They also, I believe, know they're laundering uh, child trafficking money, which is a... Oh, I've seen numbers, $35 billion a year industry. Where are so, those numbers coming from? Because you say you're seeing numbers. What is the 
data that well, you can share with me, sources? Uh, some of them are these international organizations that profess to care about child trafficking. Some of them are FBI numbers. Some of them are ex-CIA numbers, guys who are sort of out there. I don't know if I believe there's such a thing as an ex-CIA guy, but I think they just get reassigned. Um, but there, there's numbers out there that seem to be sort of mainstream legitimate claims of, you know, the, the quantity of child trafficking. And, uh, and so everyone agrees that child trafficking is a huge problem. The United States estimate maybe a million kids a year get trafficked. For is that a real host- number? Uh, I, well, it's, it's real, but it's real soggy. And that is mm-hmm. to say, I, I'm sure it's not only 20 people, um, fairly confident it's not 20 million so so in that sense it's it's somewhere near an answer um the question that one should ask is when was last time so so you read about like there's this movie this year the sound of freedom Hmm. which 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 sort of glorified the retrieval of kids from south america who had been trafficked um one of the things the movie missed was um was where the kids were going so the movie picks up on a couple of pervs, but but these kids were being trafficked. You don't traffic a kid and then sell them to some guy for 50 bucks in a trailer park, right? The, the, these kids are expensive and they're going to high places. And if you, you dig into this story, which I have, I've spent many hours actually, you find seemingly credible sources who are accusing unbelievably credible people of being unbelievably perverted pedophiles. And well, to me, that to sounds like a mo- it sounds like a movie. It's, it sounds like something That's that right. would be made up. <clears throat> There's two things I wonder about, and that make me a little bit skeptical. Is the first is like how do I how do I double check and know the quality of the data? Like I could, I mean, if you, if you dig yeah. enough, maybe there's some data. But how are you certain that it's good data and not you know something? You're not. You're not. In fact, but, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Here's why it's worse. There, there's some great, there's a Rosetta, there's a few Rosetta stones out there that help you get started. For example, there's a thing called the Franklin scandal, which for me is one of the most important Rosetta stones. It is a child trafficking ring in Omaha, Nebraska. They, they kind of busted open. And, and, and a, an ex cop dug into it big and concerned citizens you know, sort of dug into it big and the, the story unraveled and they found that they were using kids from orphanages and stuff like that. And they were being trafficked and they found the kids and they, they cross check. So they, they would talk to this person who, who was involved and, they, and he'd say, Oh, you know, there's a kid named so-and-so I think he lives out. So, and they'd go find that person. And they would talk to that person independently and they would tell the stories. They'd say, oh yeah, we were in a house here and there's all sorts of cages in the basement and stuff. They'd actually go check the house. They go, there's the dungeons for Christ's sake, right? So, so, so they were careful to, to double check and cross check. Now here's the problem. The traffickers are people of the greatest wealth and power in the, in, in the world. They're the, the highest level of the food chain, prime ministers of Belgium. Gerald Ford has been accused of it. Um, George Bush Sr. has been accused of it. Um, all over Hollywood, uh, Prime Minister of Australia. Um, and, and, and there's just so many. And, and, and their accusers are broken individuals. They were grabbed when they were five or six years old. They, to brainwash a child is child's play, if you really want to put it that way. They, they literally shape their thinking to the point where they then become this 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 being of they don't understand the the, what our reality is anymore they have their own reality and you can break down a kid very quickly and 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 uh you know you hear about for example in the u.s that eighty five thousand kids are coming across the southern border and disappearing eighty five thousand kids have disappeared coming across the mexican u.s border and that number is actually being cited by mainstream news. So this isn't even one of these, oh, I got it off Twitter kind of statements. And then the question is, where are they going? When I ask why, though, I'm wondering why y- you care about it or what do I do with this information? Because I used to be like, I, I used to be skeptical over, over geopolitics, too, and thinking to, as an investor, do I care about geopolitics? And now I'm starting mm-hmm. to understand that geopolitics can influence asset prices, of course. But where, where does all of this tie into, 
again, asset prices or financial markets? Well, one of the things it does is it 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 means, for example, that um, for me, it means it doesn't matter who gets elected now. Hmm. You can't you can't elect your way out of this mess. I mean, Epstein's book, for example, has unbelievable people of wealth and power. They're owned, which means decisions they make are at the mercy of whoever has this information. Hmm. And so I, I, one of the ideas that comes out of this is you don't corrupt powerful people. You corrupt people and then you give them power. And if the person is not corrupted, if the person is not owned, they are not given the power. Hmm. And so your your um, your entry ticket to power is to be corrupted. Hmm. But if I try to tie this into, for example, because you mentioned elections, why do elections matter to me as a European right now? Is because I know that they're going to try and keep the dollar strong at least up until the elections. Was also, you know, you look back at some of the data, dollar stays strong um, in, in a pre election year. So in 2023, it, it's also being strong. So that type of thing matters to me. Um, where, where does all that tie into, for example, the strength of the dollar or the strength of. Well, the- what makes you think what happens to the dollar, what happens to the election in any way is, is I, I don't see a correlation between elections and the dollar at okay. all. And, and well, the reason is, is because I don't believe that, that, that the people who get elected have any real authority. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're the facade. They're the facade behind what's happening. I'm a huge, huge campaigner against climate change. I think climate change is the biggest grift in history, a gigantic grift. And, and I, I, can, I can tear the case apart given enough time, no problem. And, and to the point where first and foremost, you cannot mathematically calculate the temperature in a hundred years. The physicists will say, there's too many variables. There's no chance to air bars, no chance. Can you make that prediction? And then you run into there's there's no uh, there's no credible people who don't believe it. And then you start running into Nobel Prize winning physicists all over the world who don't believe it. But see, it doesn't fit the narrative. So how it influences you is that if you know that the climate change thing is a big grift, it influences how you might invest in the research world because because because. Uh, First of all, it, it it means it doesn't matter whether or not you figure out whether this technology is going to be good or not. Because what matters is what they're going to sell us. What they're going to push on us. Yeah. I don't think, for example, the wind tar- turbine should ever be made. Solar panels are a maybe because solar panels are local source of power. So the idea of having a solar panel that delivers energy right to you, you know, sort of local provider, but the, the wind turbines look like a colossal disaster to me. And, um, and, 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 and if you realize the whole thing's a grift, then you realize that a bet on, for example, uranium is not a bet that the free market will figure out nuclear power is important. It's got to be a bet that the, that, that the, the political grift, the power grift will shift to uranium and let you have your bet. And if they decide they, and it, who's they? Well, one time I was talking to an NSA, a national security analyst, and he said, I don't like to name names. I think of it as a self-assembling oligarchy. I think of it as a murmuration of starlings. I don't know what Which that means. Which starling? Well, uh, you ever seen the starlings where they, they fly in these unbelievably aesthetically pleasing flocks? Yeah, sure. But, like I and, understand the words, but I don't necessarily understand what a well, self so, so we, Well, so which starling's leading that pack? And the answer is none. Hmm. It's this group of birds that somehow miraculously produce spectacular patterns. Schooling fish is a good example, right? Which fish is. And so, so the humans who are potentially running the operation are self assembling in the sense that they. 
they each are going to benefit by playing along with this particular group. But if you, for example, are making a bet on uranium, you're no longer betting that uranium is the best energy. You're betting that it will be allowed to be the energy. What I'm betting on when I'm be putting my money into uranium is that eventually countries like Germany are going to run into the brick wall of reality. And they're going to figure right. out that wind turbines are not sufficient to you know, provide the energy of, a, of an entire country as long as we don't have the decent battery storage, if even that's possible. So that that's what I'm betting on. I'm not necessarily betting on that, that it's going to become the new political grift, although I wouldn't mind if it did, of course, as an investor. Well, but then the question is, what if, what if they don't want to solve that problem? Right, so yeah. if you go dark down this rabbit hole, you're acting on the assumption as they're looking for solutions to problems that'll make our lives better. Um, you know, Bill Gates's father was a eugenicist. There's eugenicists out there. It was big in the turn in the early 20th century. There are people who the Club of Rome is are basically eugenicists. And they believe that the world would be a better place if we only had a billion people. And mm -hmm. I I I understand that thinking. But I don't like the idea of someone thinking, and therefore, I'm self-appointing to make that happen. Right? That's a different story. Right. And so, so the idea that Germany will figure out that they need uranium might not be relevant. So you kind of have to ask yourself some of these really gruesome questions if you want to. Now, my theory is that you're kind of right. And that is, my theory is... Um, my theory is that, that that last winter, I think, was supposed to be an energy crisis. And you guys had a mild winter. So yep. it got put off. It got put off. But I think my worldview is maybe the guys at the top, although evil bastards, also have can see the world from the best view, from the highest view. And maybe they know that we can't keep burning fossil fuels. Maybe they know that. Maybe they know that resource depletion, which is very different than CO2. Resource depletion, I'm on, 100% on board. But CO2 is not our problem. Hmm. But they're selling it as a CO2 problem. And in theory, it gets you to the same place. If it really, and my wife's an environmentalist, I say, well, an environmentalist would support natural gas. But the CO2 crowd says, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Mm. So, so you end up with these conflicted stories. So what if the guys at the very top said, we got to go to nukes? Right now, nukes are pretty unpopular still. So you could win the hearts and minds of people one person at a time. Or you engineer a crisis and you get everyone to beg. What happened when COVID showed up? You know, Fauci was talking about mRNA vaccines back in 2017. He said it would take a crisis to do it. <laughs> so you release a crisis and you get everyone to beg for the vaccine. Mm -hmm. what so so if, if, if they know we got to go to nukes, a couple of real cold winters where people suffer really badly, we'll achieve that goal. Right. Well, nuclear energy, you say, it's not that popular. It, it is gaining in popularity back again. It had a, a mild dip during COVID because it was it was on the way on the way down. Actually, since 2011, it's been it, it had been going down up until before COVID. It got a, uh, a sharp dip during COVID for some reason. Now it's taking back off again, and now it's higher. I mean, depending on how you measure it, for it's still staggering from you know Fukushima, for example. What's N not really, actually. It's good, but people are getting are warming up to it, especially in Germany, where you go places you would you would, you would assume it. So pe people are definitely warming up to it. But then there's also uh, Alex Epstein's case for the moral case for fossil fuels, right. for example. Do you think he's getting to enough people, though? I, I don't think his book is going to have uh, influence over my investments, but I think he's got a point where, like, you can think. Resource depletion is one of our biggest problems, but isn't poverty a bigger problem? And don't we have a moral responsibility towards, you know, 
helping poor countries get out of out of out of out of being poor, which is which means not having enough energy. Therefore, fossil fuels. Right. Uh, I think the assumption we want poor countries to get out of poverty is the flawed assumption. I, I don't see a shred of evidence that we care about that. We, we, the United States, let me speak for the United States. Okay. I, I don't, to me, to me, to make sense of our Middle Eastern policy, for example, I came to the conclusion that our Middle Eastern policy is don't let any one group get power. So we see some like Saddam getting power, we take them out. We see Libya's looking too stable, we take them out. We appear to be doing everything within our power to make sure the Middle East is just a nonstop source of chaos. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's our interest. fault. And is it Could, is that geopolitical interest tied to? Uh, that's something I've been getting from other people I've been talking to as well. Is that this is uh, uh, um, potentially a, a balkanization of uh, Russia, so that the west basically if you want to call them that way can control their natural resources so it is a weapon sounds like my middle eastern policy doesn't it yeah it kind of is but turn it... russia into chaos so 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 the the one thing there's two people in the world who who are super nationalists who are getting the most guff trump and putin it's not a coincidence those two guys are getting they're getting getting smacked around constantly because because the nationalists are in the way of the globalist master plan. Now, what is it? Well, I could easily imagine the West is looking at Russia saying, look at all the resources. Right. You can imagine. I can imagine that. I also think there's just a bunch of cold warriors who just can't stop thinking of the Soviet threat. So is this whole thing, so the CIA, wars, kids, whatever it might be, is this about mm -hmm. natural resources? Because if it is, I kind of think that there's a, an opportunity for me to eat some of those crumbs that to me would I, look I like agree. buildings. I agree. Um, I think they're all connected. I One of the things you do when you, when you corrupt a politician, which – again, the pedophilia scheme corrupts politicians, is that you not only put people in positions of power, but you make sure they run the world the way you want them to. Mm -hmm. and so the pedophilia acts as the guiding force. So, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, you can't do that. We got pictures of you having sex with a five-year-old. Don't make us put it out there. So all of a sudden you cooperate. Mm -hmm. And so... Whoever is in charge, and heaven only knows who it is, they don't have a Wikipedia page probably, um, they, I, I would say probably all wars are natural resource wars. In in a sense that when we talk about natural resources, is it is it only energy commodities? Like are we talking about oil, natural gas, and that's it? No, I, well, no. I think there's all sorts of metals, all sorts of minerals. Afghanistan has, has an estimated, you know, five trillion dollars worth of minerals underground. I, I would say that's by conservative. Um, and, and so Afghanistan looks like a place you'd love to send in the big bulldozers and start digging stuff out. And 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 the neocons, of course, the guys who really just think Russia is bad and we should just fight them no matter what. Um, they certainly don't want Russia getting a hold of Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, no one wins in Afghanistan. That that that's what the world keeps forgetting. Or 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 and then you've got this problem where the guys who who make trillions off off military conflicts, they just love wars. But then it's every not war about makes them resources. Well, for them it's not. This is the self assembling oligarchy. You got the guys who make a fortune on wars here. You got the bankers over here. You got the resource guys over here. You got the politicians getting their payoffs. That's a self-assembling oligarchy. Hmm. They're not sitting around a table making decisions. They just all have their interests are aligned. And if they're not aligned, they don't get the power. Hmm. You become an inconvenience and you get dealt with. You know, a, a reoccurring topic among people who 
care about these things or look at the world like you do is oftentimes to start liking gold, talking about natural resources here. Right. But but that that just it, historically has not been the best option, obviously, to just plow all your money into gold. Because there's always there's always really reasons to be worried, right? Ever since I've been, I was born in 1995, so I haven't had the best time geopolitically speaking. And I was born in Eastern Europe too in 1995. So a c- complete anyways complete mess but still since 1995 if you had just pretty much ignored all the bad things happening and had dca'd into the into the index you you made money um let me let me let me first take on the gold story and then i'll take on the equity story sure the gold story one of the favorite things is an ounce of gold has always bought a good suit Hmm. That turns out to be not a good analogy, in my opinion, because because how do you compare a toga to a three piece suit? Right. I, it doesn't make sense. A better one, which I which I presume is correct, but I, I don't know how to cross check it, is that an ounce of gold has bought a month's worth of hard labor. And hard labor in the, the, the year of our Lord, 5 A.D., is pretty much the same hard labor as the year of our Lord, 2023. And so it's a, it's a much more, um, it's much more, it's like the Big Mac inflation index, right? Big Macs haven't changed. Um, and, and so gold is designed to preserve wealth. There are times where you can make money. So, um, so since 1971, since a little later than that, when, they, when you could start buying gold legally in the United States, uh, from memory, I'm thinking gold's returned about 7.5% a year. That's a half a century of seven and a half percent a year. So, so, so people who cackle at gold bugs, they're just full of crap at some level, right? You can, you might be able to do better, but seven and a half. If, if they're not happy with seven and a half percent a year, they're going to get hurt at some point. That's that you seven and a half percent. If I could, if you promise me seven and a half percent a year for the next twenty years, whatever it is you could promise, I don't. Period. Now, let's go to the equities. So you're going to be buying treasuries soon, then, I assume? I actually do own two years, quite a few. Okay. But now 30 years. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, here's a question I like to ask people. If, if I offered you a 30-year treasury, and the rule was that you had to buy it, and you had to hold it, you couldn't sell it, and you couldn't hedge it. So I'm saying, look, I'm offering you a, an income stream with all the unknowns associated with the next 30 years. But you're not trading it. This is what I'm trying to do is shut down the idea of, well, I want to own it this week, but not next week, right? I don't care about next week. I don't care about next year. So if I offer you a 30-year treasury, what interest rate would you demand? Not knowing what inflation will be, not knowing what central banks are going to be, not knowing what the world's going to do. What would you demand before you'd say, okay, I'm taking my life savings, I'm putting it into treasuries for 30 years, locked down, no touch. What would what would you demand? My I would have a couple of questions first. And Doug Casey tells me that my first question should be who's your counterparty? And and that they would I, 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 that's a good question. I'm even willing to concede that maybe your counterparty is never going to default, even though. In that 30 years, there is a potential deal. So that's why I said treasuries. Your counterpart is U.S. government. Right. But if my counterparty is absolutely 100% insured that it's not going to default, there's always well, a counterparty. It's not 100%. It's never 100%, but it's the U.S. government. So that's part of your math. Well, that's exactly what Doug Casey tells me to be wary of, that the U.S. government okay. is your counterparty. So you have a, you have two risks. That's currency risk, currency devaluation risk, and counterparty risk. And right. so- that makes the calculation extremely difficult for me. You know, I could say very quickly, oh, I just want the 100 year going back average inflation, whatever it might be, four or five percent. Let me take that. But then you have you have to start compensating me for the counterparty and the currency risk. All uh, right. So then so now give me a guess. What your percent return pay line would be before I said. Yeah, I would take that if you said it's only you got till four o'clock today to make the call. What what interest rate would you demand? Ten percent, right? Could be nine, could be twelve, right? But you know what? Sure. It's not. 
It's not 5%. No. Which means the treasuries are priced wrong. Mm. Because they are for 30 years. The reason they're priced wrong is because they're used for trading. There's all sorts of statutory restrictions that, that cause, that produce a false demand. But there's all sorts of reasons why they're priced wrong. Mm. But they're priced wrong. And people say, well, no, it holds on. And I go, someone will hold that treasury for 30 years. It might pass hands, but that treasury is going to turn out 5% a year for the next 30 years. Mm. And therefore, they're priced wrong. So, so there's that. Now, let's go to the equity market. In 1981, 40 years ago, was really, when I talk about recency bias, some people say, oh, back to March of 2020. Some people say back to 2009. Some people say back to, two, you know, back to 1995, whatever. I go back to 81. So if, if you look at 1981, uh, I have about 25 metrics evaluation. They all give the same answer. About 25. They all tell us where we're at relative to historical valuation. But but in 1991, to use the most trite of them all, P.E. ratio, the P.E. ratio of the market was six. So your equities were priced to return, what, 15 plus percent per year? Something like that. Right? Now, inflation was breathing down our throats, right? So they were priced really terribly. Now, at that moment in time, interest rates were about to begin a four decade march down. Warren Buffett says, you want to understand bull and bear markets. It's not about the GDP. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about the direction of the interest rates. He said, you show me interest rates rising over a long period, I'll show you a bear market in equities. You show them falling over a long period of time, I'll show you a bull market in equities. We were about to begin a 40 year drop in interest rates a 40-year tailwind of dropping interest rates. Now, what a lot of people have done is mistaken Buffett's claim and said low interest rates are bullish. That's dead wrong. That's like saying you've squeezed a ton of lemon out of the lemonade, a ton of lemon juice out of the lemon. And therefore, a contracted lemon peel is good for juice. No, you're done. So once rates are low, you're done. Dropping rates are bullish. Low rates are game over. We got to negative rates. Edward Chancellor says you get to 2%, you're going to have a crisis guaranteed. We got to negative rates. We are long overdue for Edward Chancellor's crisis. So rates drop for 40 years. Quite a tailwind. The same time, Russia, although hadn't failed yet, was failing and needed capital badly. It started selling resources. And we started helping. We were sending in our, you know, once the Berlin Wall fell, we were sending in our experts and helping them pump oil and whatever else, right? So it became a great source of resources. China was coming out of the Dark Ages. They had billion people. It is said that they had so little cash reserves in their bank that they had trouble finding the money to buy a ticket for, was it Dao Jinping? When he visited the United Nations in 1981, they had to, they had to look under the seat cushions to find the money. It is said that they had $38,000 foreign reserves in their banking system. They needed capital. What did they do? For the next 40 years, they sold labor for pennies. So for 40 years, we had Chinese, billion Chinese, making stuff for us at slave labor prices. Quite a tailwind. We had, therefore, valuations were at all-time lows. We had interest rates that were dropping. The boomers were just entering the workforce rally. Demographics, according to some economists, at least, are everything. You got a young workforce, they're starting to kick into gear, they're busting their butts, they're building, they're building companies, they're building their lives, they're building houses, they're doing, and they brought their wives to the workforce this time. Mm. So we had an unbelievable demographic tailwind. 
over this 40 year window with all these tailwinds, the valuation of the market. Now I have to be careful to specify valuation, not the, not the price of the market, the valuation, which is the, the price of the market divided by something it should track. So price earnings, price revenue, Tobin's Q, um, um, price to GDP. There's, I, I follow 25 of them. The valuations, which should not move, they should move around, but they are the most mean regressing metric in all of finance. Low stock valuations will give right way to high stock valuations will give rise to low stock valuations. So what happens if over the next year, interest rates march up, China's no longer selling us cheap labor, Russia's no longer providing us their cheap resources, the boomers are leaving the workforce. What happens if over the next 40 years, instead of the valuations rising at a compounded rate of over 3% a year, that is just the overvaluation of the market growing at 3% a year. What happens when that reverses? What happens if over the next 40 years, it goes down 3% a year? That's a 6% swing compared to the previous 40 years. That is an uninvestable market. So you, you talk about valuations, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I also tend to look at prices, though, and so here, here's one price, and that's that said, at around that time, eighty one, they mentioned gold and Nasdaq were about a one to one ratio. Mm -hmm. Nasdaq was about three hundred, gold was about three hundred, give or take. Don't call me the exact number. Mm -hmm. Nasdaq's now what thirteen and a half, maybe ish. I don't know exactly, but it's right. around that level. Gold's below two thousand, so. Right. I can I can see that I can see the argument for re reversal to the mean and um the, the twenty five metrics that you say that that are valuations that's what it, well, they are relative valuation metrics right they're ratios basically is what it comes down to. And no valuations are valuation. It's not a relative. It's a relative metric. The valuation is the metric. Yes. Right, but it. I mean, you're using those are not absolute valuation techniques. They're relative valuation techniques, and so what that. We're, we're, well, but they're scaled relative to something they necessarily track. Why is it? That's what I, that's what I'm getting at. Is that okay? I get it that they necessarily maybe have to track it over a long enough time period. But then, well, forty talking, years, forty years. I just gave you forty years. Right, but if we're talking about when we were talking about Buffett, and he says the market can stay irrational for longer than you can stay solvent. Right, and there's many examples. You can look at the you know my mom and dad would would I. My mom and dad would often talk about real estate and say, oh, real estate is really expensive in Belgium or like I mentioned in Bulgaria or whatever it might be. And I'm like, yeah, but Canadian real estate, right? It can always get worse. Um, and so mm -hmm. the market is, it has stayed, the, the the real estate market is a very recent example in Canada, stayed irrational for longer than uh, home buyers have stayed solvent. And so that's sort of where where I, I find it tricky to, to deal with because it, you're, you're impossible saying impossible to deal with. Impossible to deal with. Right. You're saying it's inevitable. It is. But is it imminent? No. And, I'm and just saying over the next 40 years. Okay. There's no chance the next 40 years can repeat the last 40 years, in my mind. Hmm. The last 40 years had a three and a half percent rising valuation tailwind. So if you can say, why can't the market just stay super valued? And the answer is because that means they're priced to return nothing. So if you buy an equity, here's, here's another good anecdote. that You hear about the super stocks, seven, ten, huge companies that, that were the source of all your gains, right? Tesla, Microsoft, you name it. And the articles all say, um, therefore, you should have owned them. I go, well, thanks for telling me now. Right? That was really helpful. Um, now tell me what the next 10 super stocks are going to be. And no one can. Mm -hmm. Nobody can. They'll tell you it's going to be AI or whatever. I guarantee you they're wrong. I, somewhere out there, the next super stocks are just a twinkle in some guy's eye somewhere. 
And, and, and so then they say, well, so then what do you do? Well, then you index. And what you're hoping is that somehow the next super stocks will, um, will show up and you'll catch the next bubble. But we're right now at the pinnacle of the biggest bubble in history, I would argue. So you're not going to catch the next bubble until you've unwound that first bubble. If we're at the pinnacle, though, that that, that makes that makes it imminent. Um, no, no, no. It could stay up there for a long time. Mm. It could get worse. But if you know, if you know a train is coming, and you don't have the schedule, are you going to put a tent and camp there? If I don't have anywhere else to sleep, and I know that I can get out on time. If I think I can, you don't know if you can get on time. <laughs> yeah, I know. That is the problem. Mm. And crashes, by the way, corrections, we haven't had a correction since 1967 to 81. What do you mean? We haven't. To me, I have a definition of a correction, which I think is true. That is to correct. You have to not only correct price, you have to correct attitude. Oh, like valuations? You, you, okay. So you, the last 40 years have not only not corrected attitudes, they've reinforced attitudes. They've left people with a sense of invincibility. Oh, you idiot. You got out? Look at what it then did. Never get out. Don't get out. So you just, they, they're telling you, stay in there, stay in there, stay in there. At some point on some fateful day, which in Japan was on some day in 1989, when all the people were crowing about how rich they'd gotten and how Japan from 1945 to 1989 had been nothing but a juggernaut of wealth creation. And then 14 of the 20 largest companies in the world were Japanese. And that we were sending management teams to Japan to find out what the Japanese that were doing was so spectacular. Not realizing we were witnessing the end of a massive credit bubble. And on some fateful day, when optimism, as measured by price of the market metric, reached a maximum. Maximum optimism, maximum price. You reach this moment where the optimum is at a maximum, when the reason for optimism is zero. So at that turning point, optimum has reached an apex where there is zero, zero reason for optimism based on what happened in the next 20 years. Mm. So if you, for example, owned Japan, the DK, which many Japanese did in 1989, you're still way underwater. You're getting close to break it even without adjusting for inflation and lost opportunity and all the other awful things. You're not there yet, though. But there's even the interesting question. What if you were a young punk? You just got out of school and you started a job in 1989 and you started putting, we'll call it $1,000. It would be some number of yen, 100 times that number of yen. And you started averaging into the Nikkei. How long did it take, rhetorical question, um, to break even? So you average your way out. Took 20 years hmm. to break even. Starting averaging down at the pinnacle. Forget about having a wad of your savings at the pinnacle, like a boomer does right now. So I think the boomers going forward, if they stay exposed to the market, can't possibly win. Hmm. So if I if I if I had bought the 1989 top. In a Nikkei, mm -hmm. which was about thirty nine thousand, mm -hmm. which was still what thirty percent away from something like that. Yeah, so right. It, so right, and it seems like we might be. I mean, it seems like it might be going up again because since twenty twelve, it's done nothing else. But if I'd started buying right. then and I was dollar cost averaging as it was going down, twenty years before you were even. Okay. What? Well, That's an uninvestable market. True. That's a so what happens if the global debt bubble, which I think is global, what happens if the world becomes uninvestable? 
But it's also worth noting that their market went up like 40x over 25 years. Right, right. Well, but uh, some guy who's 55 years old, who's invested in 1989, uh, I'm guessing he did pretty well. He got destroyed. Yeah. Because you make bad decisions when you perceive wealth that doesn't exist. Mm. You buy a house that's too expensive. You buy too many cars. You buy a second house. Just You buy steak instead of hamburger. You spend your money. You count on it. How many boomers now are going, oh, I'm doing pretty well. I think I'll retire. And the problem with that is, let's say you're 65 and you're retired. What if you live to 90? How much, how, how many, how much do you need to retire safely at 65? And the answer I have will bother people to no end. I think to the extent it's possible, you will get no returns for the next 30 years to speak of. You better have 30 multiples of your salary. Very few people have 30 multiples of their salary. Fidelity says you need eight. Hmm. If things don't go well, you only need eight salary units if you're going to plan on living for maybe 10 years, maybe. Hmm. It also could be you need eight multiples of your annual salary if you plan on living five years because the thing cuts in half. Right. Right. There's no, once you're at the lofty valuation levels, there is no painless way back. Hmm. You either, and I, I actually created a plot of this showing the growth of the GDP. It was like two and a half, three percent assumed GDP shows that the market's elevating to twice that. And then the question is how to get back to the trend line. You cut the markets in half. I think that's the merciful way to do it. But then what you get, you get yet again a V bounce. If you cut the markets in half today, the dip buyers will show up as an army. And therefore, the correction is not a correction because it doesn't include the change in attitudes. Mm. The 67 to 81 correction was a correction because it lost 75% inflation adjusted over 14 years. The end of 14 years, you go, I have been ground to dust. At which point, it turns out to be the perfect time to buy. Sounds like you're describing commodity prices over the last 20. No, that's too much. Over the last, well, it sounds like you're describing commodity prices. It sounds to me like this equity super cycle might turn into a commodity super cycle. See, I actually potentially believe this model. The only, the only thing that's got me conservative, if you said go Texas, hold them all in, you got, I, I got quite a bit of cash in the, I call it to your treasuries cash, right? Um, if you said push all your chips into the table, what do you buy? I would bet on the commodity super cycle. Hmm. That would be my best bet. So of all my equity positions, which there are not that many, the, the biggest, I, th I think the biggest equity position is Rio Tinto. Okay. An and the re choice. well, the reason is is because it has a play on the ESG crap, which I oppose, but but it's still got a play on it. It it's 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 got a good balance sheet. It it's got a good dividend. And one of the things I looked at is said, where are their mines? And the only way you could take out Rio Tinto's mining operation would be an asteroid. It's they're global. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And so. The risk of going into something like Rio Tinto now is when the selling starts, everything sells. So I could go into Rio Tinto as a, as a cheap equity and find it gets cut in half. And I had Jesse Felder one day in a sort of a personal exchange said, look, don't let a good opportunity go by because of your macro view. And that's why I actually did. I, I did go into energy in 2020. And if I, if I called it right, I hit the bottom precisely. There were two things that made me start to go into energy again. So I went into energy in 2001 purely as an inflation hedge. And I went looking for, for ways to do it. And I said, commodities, got to be commodities. Now, I, I was really a neophyte. I was really flying blind. So I actually talked to, to Jimmy Rogers' partner in the Rogers Raw Material Fund for about two hours. He was entertaining to talk to 
And then I talked to one of the market makers for it, and I didn't like it. Too many derivatives, too many weird things. I didn't trust it. So I said no. So I went into Fidelity funds and bought a bunch of energy mutual funds and said, I'm just going simple. And I rode about 13 years of really great returns from energy. And then oddly, Fidelity kicked me out of the funds without me knowing it, which really amazing. I don't even look at my returns. I have I follow it on the screen, but not not at Fidelity. It took me a year to realize they'd kicked me out of my energy funds. And uh and I uh and I uh I got kicked out of them, which saved me a lot of money. And I asked, should I go back in? I asked some hedge fund managers that said I wouldn't right now. Hmm. And so I caught some of the downslope, the sort of 2013 to 15 or 16, something like that. And then in 2020, two things jumped out at me. One is Exxon got kicked out of the Dow. And I said, oh, that's a bottom call for commodities. Yeah. They just replaced Exxon with Salesforce.com. Holy moly, what a bad move. Hmm. And then Jesse Felder, who I think does great work, noted that 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 energy, which at the peak was 16% of the S&P, had dropped to 2% of the S&P. I go, time to go back into the energy. Mm. And I timed it perfect, but I didn't go big because I'm still convinced that a big bear is coming. Like a, you know, next calendar year, next two calendar years coming. It just feels imminent to me. And I might be waiting 10 years. Mm. But I in, I intend, and I had a lot of cash in 08, and I blew it. I blew it be, out of greed. Because I, people don't know this. The market at the bottom in 08 was slightly below historical fair value. And it was there for about a month. Which means it was basically a, a one-night stand with fair value. And, and I was positive, based on history, there was way more damage to be done to the economy, to the markets, because we had just come off this massive bubble. And what nobody on the planet saw coming, I don't think anyone saw coming, was $30 trillion of stimulus. And if I had seen that coming, I might have gone in. I, when they bailed Bear Stearns for 30 30 billion, it sucked the oxygen out of the room. That's comically tiny now. Yeah. But I didn't see 30 trillion coming. So, so my worst decade by far relative to my competition was the teens. Hmm. By far. My best decade was the knots. So from 2000, January 1st of 2000, um, of 2000, of 2000, January 1st of 2000 to, to December 31st of, of 2009. While my peers were getting banged by two big bad bear markets, I compounded 13%. That was, so I had a great 90s because I was a tech bull, believe it or not. But relative to my competition, the knots were the big decade. Right, right. But the teens, I made something like 4% hmm. compounded. Well, I, well, everyone else was 13, 14, whatever, big numbers. Yeah. And all laughing at me and saying, ah, oh, see, you missed it. And I go, yeah, well, I'm still, a, my last 20 is still better than your last 20. I wish I had Texas holding them all in. I wish I had caught it. But I think the next 10 is going to be brutally difficult to invest, including, I have no idea what's going to happen to the, the hard asset guys. I, I, it's, it's just so hard to know. But I'm waiting for fat pitches. And right now is not a good time to be going for fat pitches. There's just not many. Not even in commodities. Well, you know, every once in a while I get an idea and I buy a little bit. And I kind of just watch it. and I think about it. But but I have, I, I by the way, own the three biggest platinum miners. So, Bonnie, three, is there three? Im, Imperial. I think it's Imperial. I don't know. I, I-M-P-U-Y. Um, All right. Sabanye. Sabanye. And Anglo American Platinum, I think it is. Oh, Anglo American, oh, yeah. And 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 um, you're you're not gonna believe how I picked up on them. I was watching a YouTube with a it had about a hundred clicks, and literally about a hundred views. The guy analyzed the balance sheet of the three platinum miners. I go, holy moly, look at those things. Those are tobacco stocks. Mm, it's true. 
They had strong balance sheets. They had great cash flow. They had dividends, you know, seven to nine percent. About those, I don't own a ton. And platinum hadn't moved, so there wasn't even the platinum meme tailwind that you would hope someday might show up and drive platinum to twenty thousand and make those guys some serious money. Hmm. Platinum hadn't moved, and they were doing well. It turns out it was rhodium that was doing it. Um, and then I got a call one day from a guy who says I'm the uh, the largest private holder of Sabanye. I'd like to chat. And I go. I, yeah, you think? I, I love to chat. And he explained to me how Savanier works and stuff like that. And I spent a couple days with him this summer. And uh, I'm patiently waiting. But they're paying me to wait. Right. Is it? But I have a lot of cash. A lot of cash. When you're talking about potentially a commodity super cycle, when we talk about commodity, that's just, it's too much to describe as one thing. Because different different market forces move different commodities. So, Precious metals, base metals, energy, that's sort of the three soft commodities. Companies. Okay. Gee, I, I don't I don't I, I know nothing there. So it's nothing that that I don't even know how to get exposure to. Like I'm not gonna stack a bunch of orange juice in my fridge because that's not gonna no, work. No, but here's what you want to pay attention to the soft commodities. The war on farmers right now. Hmm. This gets back to the the sinister um why you need to know about sinister conspiracies going on. There is a war on farmers. They are trying to destroy farmers. Northern Europe is getting clobbered. The Northern European farmers in Netherlands are getting clobbered. Bill Gates is the largest owner of farmland in the United States. There's something very wrong going on in farming. If you can figure out what that story is, you might all of a sudden find the soft commodities are really interesting. Mm. Yeah, I have not figured out what's going on. They blame nitrogen pollution. I go, you're making shit up now. That, that's just crazy. It's true. Yeah, uh, but what what of those four? Okay, four. So I can I can write down soft commodities too. But so precious base energy soft commodities. What are you again? If if you had to guess based on on your again knowledge of geopolitics, macroeconomics, everything everything that we talked about today, kids, wars, CIA, whatever, bolt it all together. You think there's a commodity super cycle coming? Where's where's the alpha within the commodity space? Well, I'm partially biased by the fact that I have a ton of gold. I mean, I have one ton. No, not literally. A ton. <laughs> I'm kidding. I have. Uh, I have to guesstimate this. I probably have ten annual salaries of gold. Nice. Right. I don't need more gold. I own, and that does include silver, which is a much smaller percentage, but but still quite a bit. Um, probably an annual salary of silver. Um, silver would be more interesting than gold to me for that reason alone. Um, I think the energy space is the most interesting. If we have a global depression, uh, you got to figure the industrial commodities are going to get hurt. And energy could get hurt. Because energy correlates really strongly with economic activity. Mm. I mean, they're they're almost the same curve, right? And so, um, and so again, back to this idea: if we go through a grinding, uninvestable market slash economy, there will be very few people who will do well. It's going to be it, you're going to be graded on a curve. And so if you could lose less than the next guy, but I have no intention, I'm trying not to lose. And then the question is, I, for example, I'm, I'm in a minority. I don't think Powell's fighting inflation. I think Powell is trying to find a way to get the speculators down. I think Powell knows he has a bad equity bubble. Hmm. And I think he's trying to deflate the speculation in the equity markets. And they're ignoring him. So right now we've got a bond crisis brewing. So the 10-year treasury keeps, the yield keeps going up. And and there's something like $15 trillion worth of U.S. bonds are going to roll over in the next year or two. Who's going to buy them? Not China, not Russia. Is the treasury just, is, 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 is the Federal Reserve just going to buy them all? And if they do, what's the consequence of that? That's when you own the gold, I guess. Um, 
And so, and, and there's you know, some people say, well, they're going to buy some. I go, what if they just let the rates soar? Mm -hmm. Then the buy is going to be treasuries. Right? If I, I was nothing, this was just dumb luck. In 1980 to 87, I was nothing but bonds. The crash in the equity market. I was sitting in the coffee room with an old guy, and he said, I said, I don't have any equity, so I don't know. And he said, you should own equity. So I dug into the equity and said, yeah, you know, I should own equity. So it was the crash of 87. And so I moved a wad into equities. And I wrote them all up from 87 till 99. And in 99, first in 98, and then again in 99, I pulled every last share out of the market because it was an epic bubble. And, and I did the math and I said, somewhere at some point while I'm camping on the railroad track, a train's coming. And, and, and if you can say, look, over time, you can't win. Then the question you have to ask yourself is, am I the guy who wants to win short term? Am I that guy? Do I have that skill? And I don't have that skill. I can't trade markets. I can buy cheap. I can sell expensive, it appears. I can sell expensive and watch them get way more expensive. Mm. The mistake I made in 08 was the greed. What I should have done is said, look, we're at fair value. Given that we're at fair value, forget about where we're going. How, how, what percentage equity should I have? And then when we went, if we'd gone way, way below fair value, then I'd say, now what percentage should I have? So greed kept me from, from buying the right amount at the right levels. Because I was confident. I thought I could bottom call it. Mm. I thought the bottom was another 20% easily. Easily, I thought we were going to do a 90% plunge. From here, if you said, what's the correction? 75%. That's my, to me, to me, to me, fair value. You want to look at any metric evaluation. Look at that metric in 1994 and say, what happens if we go back to that? The market, the metrics all took off in 94. I don't know why. There's theories. But if you look at price earnings ratio, it was normal in 94. And then it took off price to revenue, price to sales, price to book, price to you name it. It was normal in 94. And then it took off. So if you've got some cool metric, look at the metric compared to 1994 and say, how much would it have to drop to get to 94? And it's a big number. It, it's a real swan dive. So I have fair value of the S&P somewhere in the teens. That sounds like too far uh, when you look at the S&P right now. And, and well, and let me ask you theory. this: when, when, when oil was one fifty, could you picture it going to minus thirty <laughs> seven? Right. It's true. Yeah, I have over <laughs> that period, however, learned how to buy high and sell low. So I, yeah, I, I don't to, have that skill. Right. I don't. I, I just don't have that skill. So you yeah. and I have different skill sets, which is why, why I say it's dangerous. Get out of the way, and you say oh, I can play the danger. And that's fine. I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm saying the exact opposite. I've done the exact opposite. I've bought the tops and I've sold the bottoms so far in, in multiple times, uh, which has okay. caused me to lose a, a bunch of my own money. But what I'm thinking here is it, since the market has just performed well, economic, since 2020 is what I'm talking about when I started doing this more seriously. GDP is up 10%. Unemployment is below 4%. CPI is below 4%. What else? Market, market has almost doubled. And that's happened when global liquidity has, has been falling. Um, well, most recently last year, U.S. liquidity has been kind of flat, but still too down. What happens when they go back to pumping liquidity into the system, back to QE? Those $30 trillion of QE that you mentioned that came in 2008 at the bottom and, and brought us from 2008 to now. What well, first of all, I, I, I question whether the CPI is a metric you want to use. Hmm. Because I think it's crap. Hmm. I, I think inflation's way worse. Ask any mother 
sure. who does the grocery shopping and say, what's the, what's, what's, what's the inflation rate? And it's not what we're being told. Let's start with that. But, but I don't know how to come up with an inflation rate. There are various metrics that try to get it right. Um, I had the most, in, one of the most interesting plots that was handed to me by, by a guy named Ryan Grice of the chart store. He shows the performance of the S&P. This is a little tangential, but it's a great plot. The S&P corrected, not for inflation in the normal sense, but corrected for the M2 money supply, which seems like a pretty good metric of inflation if you're kind of a monetary guy, right? So if you correct for the M2 money supply, the market hasn't moved in 100 years. Hmm. Is it possible, it's actually overvalued now, is it possible that the entire capital gains of the market are inflation? And it's the only the only thing you make is dividends. Hmm. Now, during that hundred years, dividends went from six and a half to what's now currently one and a half, which means the market is four times overvalued. Four times overvalued to get back to six and a half percent dividend. Do, do, does it have to? That's again the, the question. Like, what, why? What? What force says that it has to? Uh, because if it doesn't, then your returns will be bad. So, so, so we all have assumptions. Hmm. And when I ask you the question, how many, um, how many annual salaries do you need to retire at 65? My assumption is you're not going to make anything. And therefore, if you're going to live 30 years and it takes you an annual salary per year to live, you better have 30 annual salaries. Now, you know, some, uh, some of my annual salary, a pretty good chunk actually goes into savings. So I say, well, I'm not going to have to save anymore. So I can take that out and other expenses change. But crudely speaking, if you're spending your salary every year, you're going to live 30 years. You don't earn anything on your investments. Mm. You need 30 annual salaries. And then you can start negotiating with God at that point to try to find an alternative interpretation. Again, Fidelity says eight. There's no way Fidelity's right. They're lying. You retire with eight annual salaries. If we get a correct, if we correct back to everyone else's fair value, not, not Dave's, but the euphoric fair values that are being sold to us by Wall Street, it's still a big correction, which means you no longer have eight annual salaries. You have five. How long are five annual salaries going to last you if you retire 65 with five annual salaries? You're humped. Yeah. You can't win unless you can live off Social Security. True. Yeah. Social Security. That's a, it's a whole nother can of worm, worms. Right. So is that... We, we've so, gone... so, so, so I don't think we get... I, I, I don't think there's a... There's no safe route home. Hmm. You can either stretch it over a vast time of time swath, which scares me the most. I would rather get crushed. I would rather go through 29 to 33 in the U.S. than 89 to, 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 to 2009 in Japan. Because I don't want to kill 20 years. I want to buy assets at good valuations. And if they hold them up here, and if, if there's other very strange things, kind of John, God damn, I can never remember his name. Um, New York Post journalist, been around for years, decades. And the, and, and, um, and Horizon Kinetics both came to the same conclusion. You look at the PE ratio. This is scary stuff. You look at the PE ratio of the triple Q. And it is reported as 25 or something. You go, well, those are growth companies. So, you know, they can stop growing. You could have a problem. But those are growth companies. So P of 25, okay, they're too expensive. Maybe it should only be 15. You go, well, we just lost 40% if it goes to 15. So there's that. But let's ignore that for a second. Let's say 25 is okay because they'll grow. It turns out the way they calculate it, apparently it's in their perspectives, according to Horizon guys, Murray Stahl and his buddies. Um, when you have a PE in the triple Q 
if it's above 40, they round it down to 40. Hmm. If you don't have earnings in the triple Q, they assign you a PE of 40. They calculate the PE by treating the triple Q as a conglomerate, big, huge Berkshire Hathaway equivalent. And they ask, what is the price of that to the total earnings of that? And they come up with 90. Hmm. And it's right there in plain sight for those who want it. I wish I could remember that guy's name. So, so this journalist, I can't remember, did the same thing with the Russell and gets the same sort of answer way, you know, factor of two and a half higher PE ratio because they use the same shenanigans to calculate it. That's an, so we're an getting duped. Of sorts, so there's probably outliers that kind of mess with that calculation too. Maybe, but when you buy something that which the conglomerate is said to have a PE of 25 and it has 90. <clears throat> now let's go back to the super stocks. I missed something there. The super stocks, the 10 that are carrying the market. People say, well, just make sure you own the 10. Here's the question I like to ask. What has gone wrong with capitalism when 490 very large companies that supposedly make products and provide services are returning nothing to their owners? If you bought 500 gas stations, and 10 of them made you money and the rest made you nothing, you'd sell them. You wouldn't hold on to those 490. You'd sell them. So I think one of the problems the Fed is facing is we've got these, these headwinds you just talked about, right? You've got, we've got inflation issues. We've got war issues. We've got resource issues. We've got all sorts of things to scare the crap out of the market. And the market is flipping off the Fed saying, well, since we know you're going to save us, we're not selling them. That's an attitude problem. Do you have kids? No. Well, if you have kids, one of the things you find sometimes when you go to sort of reprimand them, just not clicking. That toddler's just not hearing you. And you kind of have to push and they're just, they're just buzzing, maybe ate too much candy or something. Eventually, you got to get them to the point where they're crying. They're forcing you to play your hand. You go, okay, I'm serious. And you got to bark at them. And next thing you know, they're all teary-eyed. The Fed has got to get the market to not humiliate the Fed. What does that mean? It means the Fed wants the market lower. And the market's saying we're not going lower. So what's the Fed going to do? You think they're going to save the market? No, I don't think so. Well, it might be about more than the market. 30-year mortgage is, what, 8%? And it's going to start getting real tough, real soon. It is tough for most Americans based on, on what I can see. Right. Where's the crises? Good question. Where's the crises now? We've gone from from... So, so if if you if you could buy a house at three percent now it's eight percent. You know what it's like going to a realtor. You walk in, the realtor says, "How much do you have? How much do you earn? Here's how much you can afford to buy," and then you buy that. With mortgage rates at eight percent, you can only afford half as much. That means at some point the housing market has to cut in half because the consumers can't afford the current prices. They can only afford half. So it's like the bond market in many ways, where at some point when you roll over your debt, you got to refinance, you go, I can't afford 8%. It's like, well, I actually don't care whether you can afford 8%. That's what you're going to pay. So we've got a catastrophic um, series of credit crises coming our way. I don't see any way to avoid them. Because people are going to pay 8% instead of 3%. And companies, which, by the way, took out debt to buy back shares, now have to roll over their debt. Oh, by the way, they're not getting it for 2% or whatever. They're getting it for 8%. Mm -hmm. They're going to not buy back their shares anymore. Another tailwind just went away. So we have not seen any of the consequences of the rates 
quadrupling almost. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it, you see the movie Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Remember when the, the torpedo bounces across the runway and, sure. and Red sticks his head up and says, hey, guys, it's a dud, and then he blows up. Right now, Red has just said, hey, guys, it's a dud. Hmm. There, there has to be credit crises. There has to be credit crises. There's too much debt. And right now in Ithaca, for example, there's no inventory. There's no movement. You say, oh, the market's tight. No, it's not tight. It's broken. The sellers and the buyers are not meeting in the marketplace. I was told recently by a realtor, the prices are starting to come down. No inventory and the prices are starting to come down. It's a supply thing, though, as well. That's what I wanted to say. It's like there's no inventory. There's no supply. There's no in incentive because because home builders need capital too, right? They're the mo most indebted right. companies out there. Right. No, but the supply problem is people are just not selling their houses. What happens when I have to move? Then all of a sudden my house gets forced on. No, but you, we're we're mobile. I, I If I have to move, let's say I lose a job. My house is too big. I got to sell my big house. Hmm. There's just reasons why life. What happens if I go to retire? What happens if I have to go to an old folks home? And I got to move out of that house, that McMansion, which was built with crappy sheetrock and costs a fortune. And that inventory has to show up on the market. And all of a sudden, there, it's a bidless market. Because there's no one who can afford it at the price you think you're going to get. So at some point, it's going to be, it's just, it's going to be this air pocket because there's no 8% mortgage mortgages that people can afford to buy your house at the price you perceive your house is worth. So right now it's the, you know, I hate to use trite coyote going off the cliff hasn't looked down yet, but it is a metaphor that's trite because it makes sense. Mm. We haven't yet figured out that we're toast. So if if we revert that back to commodities, that would mean that the only commodities that make sense right now are the commodities where even if they went through demand destruction, the supply would be so low that the price would still have to go up, which means that you focus on supply challenges commodities. I see, that's where you know where where your knowledge of commodities so far exceeds mine that I can't even shake my head yes or no. Mm. I, I just okay. I, I don't know how the commodity market responds. I don't have a real good feel for how it responds, especially um I do remember commodities did pretty well during oh eight oh nine. Is that correct? I don't remember getting my ass kicked badly with my energy stocks. Commodities in, in twenty eleven uh ish. So yeah. It's such a distant memory. Um so I, I I don't know how commodities will respond, mm. and as I think I said it before the show, if if you if you had a crystal ball, and and I were to tell you, look, healthcare is going to go up tenfold over the next fifteen twenty years, would you buy health insurance companies? You would and think. I, I no, no, I would have said no, because they're going to get buried in these rising costs. Well, they found a way to make a fortune, right? But I wouldn't have known that would be the way it would play out. I, I, I would have said, well, now they're trying to, now, now they're, they're, they've got these promises they've made, and it's getting real expensive. How are they going to keep up? I would have said that was a problem, right? Right. Yeah. But I can tell you, the healthcare system's broken. It is absolutely broken. So I don't know how to play that either. The response to the 08 crisis was um, the, the way you would think it's over, like oil dropped from what was it, 150, almost 140 maybe, to like 40. So it, right. it lost a big chunk. But then gold went up. So it, it exactly, I, was, I mean, it happened what you would expect to happen during a panic. And, um, I guess, I, I guess, I, I, I don't know. 
I, I just don't know what to expect anymore. So I, I, um, um, the rush to gold. There's probably another one out there. Yeah. Um, I don't need any more gold, so I don't think too hard about that. No, because you um, have one ton of it. I have, yeah, I have a metaphorical ton. Um, and and the other thing is the next crisis will look different. And what if what if you know this gazillion dollar bailout they did in 08, 09, What if they're boxed in because inflation? What if it's a stagflationary crisis? then they can't come to the rescue. And if they do, then they're really going to cause a problem. And it's going to be on their watch. And one of the things you've got to ask yourself, one of the reasons, one of the arguments I give is Powell has two paths he can follow. One is to be the predictable central banker who bails out banks. And he'll just follow some script. And that's what everyone's assuming. So we have trouble. What a lot of people don't realize is, you know, from the point that the Fed start cutting rates, the bottom of the equity bear market is usually about a year and a half later. So if they somehow think that we're going to be in the clear once the Fed starts cutting rates, they're ignoring this. The people who say, well, gold will get crushed when rates are going up. I go, did you pay no attention to the 70s, the 80s? I, you know, eventually they got gold to behave itself. But gold went up with the interest rates for a long, long time. So, so there's just really unpredictable things. But... There's Jerome Powell, the human being, who's sitting there going, do I want to be Arthur Burns and be despised by history? Mm. Or do I want to be Paul Volcker? And he might choose the Paul Volcker wrote, which means tough love. It'll be interesting to see where, where it goes. Uh, November 1, I believe, is the next meeting that comes up because a lot has changed you know, there's the conflict in the Middle East that came up. Again, uh, a thirty-year mortgages are very expensive right now. So a lot of a lot of there's a lot of forces that are helping Powell do his job where it's maybe not necessary for him to do a Volker. Right. Um. So it, right. again, unpredictable. There's this. You know what it is? There's just arguments for absolutely every case that you can. But make. there's also a lot of cover for it too, right? So if things are not breaking. He can keep doing what he's doing. Mm. Right. So one time Richard Russell was asked, why can't you just keep going up forever? And he said, go into your kid's room and start stacking their blocks. Just keep stacking them. What happens? And what you end up with is the taller the stack, the more shock sensitive it becomes. It reaches a point where someone slams a door downstairs somewhere and it vibrates and the whole thing comes down. So the further from equilibrium you get, this is chemistry speaking now, the further from equilibrium, which is what I would call fair value, you get, the more shock sensitive you get, avalanches, earthquakes. If you say, oh, we haven't had a bad earthquake in California in 50 years, that's great. I go, no, it means there's a huge amount of pressure built up in there. You're going to get an earthquake, right? You're going to get volcanoes in, in Hawaii. That, that, you know, some of these things, the longer you go, the more dangerous it gets for precisely that reason. And I think, I think financial crises fit that description. So this idea that it hasn't happened is precisely the prerequisite for it to happen badly. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But it, cause what you're mentioning is it comes from science and I, and I can respect that because it's, it's physics or it's uh well with the stacking, the Legos or whatever it is, it's physics. And then you talk about chemistry too. Sure. Uh, but last, like I've, I've been feeling as if the markets are just made up. I don't think they even follow any natural rules. Uh, I don't know if that's true, of course, but to me, financial markets, finance in general, just like feels spend, made up. Is there ever, has there ever been a market where it got really expensive and then didn't get cheap again? No. Hmm. So, so far, I suppose, yeah, Canadian real estate. Again. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. That, that but the word yet, yeah, right? That, that in the I'm talking about 19th century. We go back to the Dutch in the 17th century. All markets that become overpriced have regressed to the mean. 
Yeah. Sometimes way through it. Sometimes to the point of going to zero, right? Um, some of the real spectacular ones. Yep. Um, what will happen if the crypto world goes bananas? The crypto is a great, a great example of inflation. What's the total crypto world worth? A trillion or something like that? No, I, I, I've lost track. I don't. I don't either. But 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 this is a trillion dollars worth of perceived wealth that came yeah, from it's zero. One point thirteen. Yeah. So about a, a right. Trillion. It's perceived wealth that's for that came from zero. So it is pure inflation. And you say, well, you can't spend it. Yes, you can. If 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 you are a hundred millionaire because you have crypto in the bank, are you not buying that nice car? Are you not buying that big house? Right? Are you not are you saving hard because that hundred million might not be there? No. <laughs> so it's the perception of wealth that, that will not persist that gets us into trouble every time. There's a global debt problem. And people say, how can you have a global debt problem? For every person that's owed something, there's a person who's, 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 who's got to pay it. It's, it's a zero-sum game. Well, here's a way to pretend. Imagine that globally the UN gets together and they say, we're going to provide free health care and free food to everyone in the world. You just created a global debt problem. You just created this vastly expensive series of promises without having created one whiff of the additional wealth to cover those. So the whole world can be in a situation where they perceive they've got a lot more coming to them than can possibly come to them. That's a global debt problem. And so the unwinding thereof is probably a, a conversation in and of itself. It will be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it comes soon. I'm sick of waiting. I want to get it over with. I don't rip off the Band-Aid. Mm. I'm poised. I've, I've, got, I've got lidocaine under the Band-Aid. If the lidocaine wears off, you know, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm ready for the Band-Aid to be pulled off. Well, if it takes another 20 years, I'm going to be hurt because time is an enemy. Well, In a bull market, time is your friend. In a bear market, time is your enemy. True, and it could be that I, I've heard I've heard different arguments. I've heard arguments for potentially sooner, soon starting a new leg up. You make you make a point with the valuations. So, um, again, there's there's an argument to be made on both sides, which to me showcases that I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing and that I should probably, you know, tread with caution. So, well, well, what I will tell you is is that the guys who sell you stuff. They're never going to make an argument for a bear market. Mm. There was a great story where they asked 51 economists in 1991, what are the odds of having a recession? Not a single one predicted a recession. And it turns out when the NBER announced when the recession had started, the survey was done six months into the recession. 51 economists batted zero on whether we would go into a recession that we were already in. So, so when fidelity, when, when, the, when the pundits say, you know, we're going to have a 10% correction, they're really lying to you because what they're really saying is only 10%. And if you told me, like I had a colleague who was having a cow over the fact that he had lost money from, um, when the market was down at one point and he had, he had lost some chunk. And I said, you just gave back gains from a year and a half ago. If I told you a year and a half ago, you would get no gains. Would you have had a cop? The answer is no. The other thing is with all this grotesque excess, that we've experienced. Is there any way that a correction, forget about my definition, is there any way that a correction will only take away a year and a half gains? And there's the answer is no. History shows us no. It takes them all back often. About half the time it takes them all back. 
half the time, about a quarter of the time, it takes half of it back. And about a quarter of the time, it takes only a quarter of it back. And it depends on your definition of bear markets and things like that. But Jim Stack did a nice analysis of that. Bear markets ravage you. Look at the Dow from 1900 to 1940. It's a fascinating plot. Just look at that from 1900 to 1940. And you can see that the soaring of the market, and then you can see the massive correction and go real low and then come back. And it's as though if you just took out the, the years from 1920 to 1940, you could just draw a line right through that. And, it, and it's this beautiful, gently rising market. But in the middle, there was this wild paroxysm that represents boom bust. Right now, I think we're in the boom. Hmm. So from 1900 to 1940. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we have the roaring 20s, and then you have obviously the, the, but, the big but, the Great Depression. But if you wide it out from 1920 to 1940, and then said someone said, fill in that gap, you, you, you just, you've never seen this plot before. You would just draw a little squiggly line across. And it would be this beautifully contiguous, slowly rising market. Right. So the 20s were the, and, and, and then you got the most famous economist in the world, wins the Nobel Prize for his understanding of the depression. Paul Krugman. Actually, uh, I was thinking Bernanke, because um, Bernanke is the depression expert, and he blames the depression on monetary policy in the 1930s. He's dead wrong. Hmm. I'm confident he's dead wrong. The depression was caused by monetary policy of the 20s. Created a massive consumer credit bubble. People think, oh, it was just a speculation bubble. No. People were going deeply into debt to buy Model Ts and all this crap. And appliances and stuff that have been invented from the Industrial Revolution. And that had to unwind. And the most amazing, you want a great book. Here's a great book. It's by Robert Gordon, and I can't remember the title, but it's something about wealth creation in the title. And he talks about all this stuff. And 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 the 1870 to 1940 was this period of amazing wealth creation, profound wealth creation. The best decade in U.S. history for what are called secondary inventions, primary inventions, electricity, secondary inventions, a vacuum cleaner that uses electricity. Mm. He said the greatest decade for secondary inventions was the 1930s. That was the Great Depression. So the correlation of what we're doing and what the prices of markets are doing, there, there's, there's some non-correlations there. Yeah. What did it take, like 25 years to get back at the highs of the uh, of the Roaring Twenties? Well, I would. I, I there's another plot that I created, and I'm sure others have. But if if you if you take from 1900 to the present, and you draw an arrow straight across from the highs, you can start in 1906. You go to you can start in 1929. There's various highs. You go from the highs and you draw an arrow across flat. Everyone likes to ask, how long did it take to recover from, say, 1929? And the answer, I think, is 1954 on an inflation-adjusted basis. I, that's not the question. The appropriate question is, when was the last time that we hit the 1929 high? Not the first time we got back to it. When was the last time we hit it? And it turns out it was 1981. We've spent anywhere from 40 to 75 years treading water on cap inflation adjusted capital gains four times in, in the last 120 years. 75 years of no capital gains inflation adjusted. Hmm. Now, it's from the ultimate peak to the ultimate trough. But it shows you you can tread water. The Nikkei, right, is trying to make price. Let's say the Nikkei reaches a new high. We haven't had a big shitstorm yet. How low is it going to go? So let's say we have a credit crisis. Where's the Nikkei going? Probably back down again, right? Hmm. 
well, I don't know, they're, they're doing some stuff. What did they... They did something today, actually. I had it noted down. They're doing something like... Yeah, a, some uh, unscheduled interventions. Yeah. Well, I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't know if anybody does, but... It means they bought a bunch of bonds, probably. Yeah. Or equities. But, uh, no, but it means well, there's a problem, too, though. It means there's a problem. They smell something. Hmm. Remember the repo crises of of nineteen of two thousand nineteen when the repo market started spiking wildly. I spent two hours on the phone one Saturday with Grant Williams, just talking about the repo spikes, trying to figure out what they were. And our conclusion is, no one knows what they are. The repo market had become an emergent system where it was acting spasmodically in a way that did not correlate with any of the usual parameters. It was spiking 10%. This is something that's supposed to be tame as hell. And then the question is, what happens when you start getting spasmodic movements? Mm. And you get stampedes and hurricanes. And right, this is where going back to sort of science. Yeah. Why does a herd of buffalo go from grazing to racing across the prairie? Because one of them belched, <laughs> right? My dog, one of them makes a little tiny noise and all four of them are running out the door as fast as they can. Hmm. Well, one of them is That's, crazy or something like that, right? Well, they're all a little crazy. They're dogs. <laughs> um, one of them's getting spayed today. Oh, okay. okay. I have to call a vet. Hmm. Um, so that's just the, the doom, doom world, according to Dave. <laughs> so summed up there's no summary of this we've we've went everywhere and anywhere mm -hmm. and it and it and it ties into it, this proves how complicated these things are and really mm -hmm. trying to deal with it is is very challenging and to someone like me again i'm i i i don't have uh, a, a vast amount of intellectual capacity i'm not the brightest of bulbs to, to put it mildly and I'm not experienced either. And so coming into this market, it's very confusing. Everything's very confusing to me. So again, I'm just trying to talk to anybody and everybody and see what what uh, you know smarter people than me make of it. Well, you're also young. So the stakes for you are different than for me. Well, if it takes 25 years to recover, it's going to be too long. The stakes for you are not good. No, yeah. no. Here's a, I'll tell you why not necessarily. My dad went through his younger years... I remember him talking in the in the 70s about how awful it was. But what he did was he went through a number of years where the markets treated him very poorly and he just saved and saved and saved. And then from 80 to 2000, all those savings ended up making him serious money. So if you want to have a bear, a bear market and a bull market, you want the bear in the first half. 20-year hmm. bear followed by 20-year bull is perfect if you start life as a bear, in the bear. Sure. You sure. just save your way through the bear, and then when the bull comes, you you don't want to have a bull market show up with no money in the markets. Hmm. You want it to show up after you've accumulated wealth. That's true. Yeah. So you're in perfect shape. Just keep accumulating wealth. I, I'll try. <laughs> I, I don't make it easy on myself, though, to be frank. When well, I'm what guitar. I'm describing is saving, though. What I'm describing is saving. Consume less than you produce. Hmm. Hmm. Good point. Well, then I may, may have to start producing more then. But, uh... <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons we're in such a tough situation now is because we've also got a generation that, can't, that just can't get jobs that pay enough to pay the bills. Hmm. They're going to get mad. Yeah, That's a whole are. nother story, right? Yeah. Unrest in the streets. What are you? What are you doing recently? You're going to the New Orleans conference. I saw that I you're going to be a speaker on there. Are you? Mm -hmm. What? Do you, what? Why do you do these podcasts? Do you have anything to sell? Do you have a book or something that you want to let people know about? You know, I write an annual review that Bob Moriarty actually uploaded a couple years worth onto Amazon and I made a couple thousand dollars from it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's free. So I don't see why you'd buy it, but uh, um, I might do a better job at that part in this year. 
I'm not even sure I'm necessarily going to successfully write it this year because I'm I'm so distracted by so many things. So I might have to switch over to a Substack model or something and just write when I can. Um, I have a bunch of followers on Twitter though. Yeah, I have a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. So if I ever did write a book, I could probably sell quite a pile just from just from hyping it on Twitter. Right. Right. And um and uh and uh I. I I don't. I, I I have nothing to sell. You know, mm. someone. You know, the Column Foundation, right? Ninety-five percent of all the proceeds into the Column Foundation will be targeted at our goal, Column. Uh, <laughs> it's like the Clinton Foundation. It's about the Clintons. Um, no, I don't have anything to sell. I I like to chat with people, and have guys like you challenge me and say, "What about this? What about that?" And the, I'm getting pretty good at battling back which may mean maybe more of a problem than a than a victory because if i can defeat you or defeat a podcaster in a discussion doesn't mean i'm right just means i won it's like a debate team a a victory over 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 me not necessarily a victory to be frank well no but it's but if people come out of it say oh colin really sort of really brought in his a game it could just mean i'm full of crap yep. but i can deliver it you know i don't know I, it doesn't mean i'm right mm. Mm. um the chemistry i do has forced me to look at complex systems and respect the complexity so well i appreciate the complexity of this conversation too and i really appreciate you putting so much time in me this was fun <laughs>